Today on Face the Nation, the embattled Los Angeles police chief gives his side in the aftermath of OJ. He is Los Angeles' top cop, but Chief Willie Williams has had little to say since the Simpson verdict. Today, we'll hear what he thinks about the charges his department bungled the case, and what action, if any, he'll press against Mark Furman, the detective the defense accused of planting evidence. And what impact is this case having on the rest of America? For that, we'll talk with two people who have very different views, Lonnie Guineer, University of Pennsylvania law professor and Republican presidential candidate, Pat Buchanan. Three ways to look at the Simpson case on Face the Nation. Face the Nation with Chief Washington correspondent, Bob Schieffer. And now, from Washington, Bob Schieffer. And welcome again to the broadcast. We start this morning in Los Angeles with Chief Willie Williams of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief, thank you very much for coming. You made a uh, speech to your officers, which I understand was played at roll call yesterday, was it, in which you uh, said that the Los Angeles Police Department is a great credit to law enforcement, just, not just there, but across the country. You said your officers had been wrongly battered uh, by the defense team uh, in the Simpson case and you told your officers to hang in there. Uh, I guess I would ask you, is that your answer to critics who say that, uh, that uh, there's a lot wrong with the Los Angeles Police Department these days and that that showed during the Simpson case? Well, no, that's just, not, that's just part of my answer to critics. The concern that I have is that the defense team and others choose to take the actions of a few people and paint 10,000 people with that broad brush. Are there things that we can learn from this case? Absolutely. Are there things that we might try to do differently or better prepare for the attacks that come from defense teams in the future? Yes. But this department is not populated by Mark Furman's of the world. This department is not populated by people who the detectives patrol SID, go out and plant evidence and frame people as was alleged during this case. And I have an obligation as the chief of police to address both the people in my department as well as the people in this community. We did not frame Mr. Simpson there is no evidence, at least to date, that we planted any evidence, and I have a responsibility to let our people in this department and the people of Los Angeles know that. Let's talk a little bit about Mark Foreman. Uh, Foreman. He, uh, of course, is uh, retired from the department. I think um, a lot of people outside uh, uh, Los Angeles may not have realized that. But uh, what, what happens next on that case? Do you intend to uh, urge the prosecutors to press uh, uh, charges of perjury against him? Well, first of all, let me just say this. Mark Furman is a disgrace to law enforcement, not just to the LAPD. And his comments are some of the most vile and vulgar language I've ever heard in my life come out of a professional, one who was supposed to be professional. We are doing a complete evaluation of Mark Furman's entire career in the LAPD from the date he started to the date he left. If we find anything that indicates that he was involved in criminal behavior or administrative behavior that can still be applied, we will go before the district attorney, we will go before the civil service board and support whatever actions are necessary. The investigation is going to take a few more months because we're looking at 20 plus years that we're re-examining. As I understand it, in some of those uh, tapes that he made, he did talk about uh, uh, planting evidence in other cases. Have you turned up anything yet that would indicate anything like that might have happened? No, we haven't turned up anything yet, but we're going back through the 1978 case they had a lot of play where he bragged about beating up people and dragging them down the steps, uh, about framing people. We're going back through some complaints involving uh, former officers that came up in the 80s. We're re-looking at his request for a medical disability and the comments that he made in 1981 and 83. But we have five people in the Department of Internal Affairs, three people from the Board of Police Commissioners, who are spending full time just re-examining this man's life in the LAPD. Well, of course, Chief, in any population uh, that large, whether it's a police department, an army, a fire department, you're always going to have some bad apples. But I, I guess the question that a lot of people have asked me is, how, how was it that he was not found out before this? Or did people know about Mark Furman before this? Well, let me say this. I think a lot of people probably knew about Mark Furman in the department and in the community here in Los Angeles and the world. But you have to understand there are few police agencies, public governments, or any other type of entity that's a public or private enterprise that will fire you or dismiss you simply because you espouse racist or gender biased views. The fact that he said he didn't like African Americans and Latinos in 1981, the fact that he said he felt like beating up people, the psychiatrist said at that time they thought he was kidding. Now, you know, I wasn't the chief of police here, 
But if he espoused those views today by themselves, we couldn't fire him unless we found out that he did frame people. The challenge is that if bias and racist views are now looked at as just as important as an officer is involved in drugs, an officer is involved in robbery, we've got to change our civil service rules, we've got to change our city charter, our state rules to make the impact of going the wrong way just as important. Uh, Chief, let me ask you this. You say you're very proud of the department as a whole, but how do you know that, that Mark Furman is not an aberration? That he, Because some people, some critics are saying that this is the culture of that particular police department, that he's well, not an exception. First of all, let me say something. I, I, I find it outrageous that America focuses on one police department because of the comments of a few people. It's like back in 1991 when the officers beat uh, Rodney King. They branded the entire organization. Now. They're saying if, we're, if there's a few dozen or a couple of hundred Mark Furmans out of uh, an organization of 10,000, that it's the entire department. I've spent three years here. I've spent 32 years in law enforcement. Based on my observations, based on what I've seen the majority of both the sworn and non-sworn do in this organization, he's not an aberration by himself. I mean, there are biased men and women in this organization, both sworn and non-sworn, but he does not represent the majority, whether they're black, white, Latino, Asian, male, or female, and I will stand by that. These people go out and risk their lives every day. They do everything from catch the bad guys on the street, deliver babies, teach children in school how to stay away from drugs. They're normal people. They've got two mortgages on their homes. They're buying a car. To, who pays Sears and Robux next week? Where do you go to school? They're just like you and I growing up in America. All right. Let's move on to, to, to a broader issue. And there's some critics say that, that, in fact, the department needs to be cleaned out from top to bottom. And, and in fact, that is why you were brought in to do that very thing. As we saw in the trial, there were some sloppy procedures uh, uncovered and uh, having to do with how the evidence was handled, the blood and so forth. Do you plan any kind of a broad overhaul there or what, what is your next move? First of all, you know, we had a few procedures that could have changed. I wouldn't characterize the overall handling of the, the work in the laboratory as sloppy. When any organization examined for 10 months eight, nine, ten hours a day, you're going to find some things that we could do differently. An example, our detective that carried the blood vial around for three or four hours. Detectives carry evidence around for hours at a time all over America. Do we need to say because the defense is going to create an aura that this is wrong, would we change it? Absolutely. Are there better ways to keep the evidence in our lab so that the defense can't say it was contaminated? Absolutely. But you have to point out, no evidence came out in this trial that indicated that the men and women of our SID unit contaminated blood. It went to Selmar in Maryland, it went to the FBI in Virginia, it went to Sacramento, and it was examined here. The results were consistent with the evidence that we presented, and there was no contamination. But we're going to try to make sure that we reduce the possibility of any contamination. If it requires a little more dollars for retraining, whatever, we'll do it. But the lab, by and large, did a good job and is still looked upon nationally is one of the better labs in law enforcement. Let me also ask you uh, uh, about the uh, the verdict and and uh, your reaction to Johnny Cochran. Of course, uh, many people are accusing him of playing the race card. Uh, do you think Johnny Cochran was out of bounds in his comments to the jury? First of all, I have a problem with singling out one attorney in this whole thing. You know, there were 12 people sitting at that desk. They all decided they were going to play the race card, or they all decided to attack my department. It wasn't just one individual. I have a problem with the defense playing the race card when they know it would only involve the few people and they attack the organization. Defense attorneys are supposed to do whatever is necessary to get their client off. In this regard, they were very successful. But what they left in the aftermath was an organization in this city and around this country that is painted with the broad brush as being racist, as being sloppy in how they handle the work. And we're going to have to live with that for years to come. And that's what was wrong. All right. Chief, I want to thank you very much, and I wish you the best of luck in the coming investigation. In a minute, we'll come back and talk with Republican presidential candidate Patrick Buchanan. In just a minute. And we're back now with uh, Pat Buchanan, who's campaigning for the 1966, uh, 96, I guess it is. We started in 66, Bob. <laughs> Republican presidential nomination. You heard Chief Williams. Uh, and the reason we ask you here today, Mr. Buchanan, I'd like to get your take on how you think this is going to affect politics and how this whole thing has affected the American people in general. All right. Well, first, let me talk about what Chief Williams said. He's exactly right. Whatever mistakes the prosecution may have made, or even the police may have made, they were out to establish justice. They were out 
for a search for truth. I think they believe deeply that O.J. Simpson was guilty and they did their best to establish justice. On the contrary, Bob, I think the defense in this case was out to frustrate justice and, was, and it obfuscated the truth. And I believe the result was a verdict that offended Americans because it appeared to be a moral outrage. An individual whom a mountain of Everest of evidence showed was guilty has walked free to a party. There has been jubilation and exultation. And so I think this is what has outraged the American people. And I think that moral outrage is justified. And whatever you say, again, against the prosecution, I think they were genuinely trying to do justice. And I cannot say the same thing for the entire defense team. And I noticed Mr. Shapiro of the defense team seemed to agree when he said, basically, we, we played the race card and we dealt it from the bottom of the deck. I think we all ought to take a look at the criminal justice system and even trial by jury in this case when the most famous trial in our history produces a verdict like this. You say you believe the American people were offended mm -hmm. by, this, by this verdict, or at least some mm -hmm. of the American people. I uh, the best but I would like to ask mm -hmm. you, what do you think will be... What will, what will happen because of that? Do you see, uh, some people say that this may well spell the end of affirmative uh, action programs because there'll be such a white backlash. Well, Is that I, what you're saying? Not at all, not at all. I think people are morally outraged because their innate sense of justice has been offended. I don't think we can come together on the O.J. Simpson trial because I don't think it deserves our respect or commands our respect. But we do have to accept it, Bob, and we do have to move on. And where we can come together, and I think black folks and white folks really want to come together is on the high ground of justice. And that means equal justice for all and special privilege for none. It means a poor black man who is arrested, if evidence has been planted against him, he ought to go free. But if someone is rich and famous and powerful and has clever lawyers and commits murder, he, even though he's got that, ought to go to prison. And that innate sense of justice is in all of us, as is, I think, a desire of Americans really to have one country. Uh, but how do you correct that? Uh, as, as a candidate mm -hmm. running for president, can you, do you have some way to, to reform the legal system that uh, will change any of that? Well, I'll tell you, Bob, the, um, I'm, I'm deeply troubled by the, the exaltation and jubilation at the verdict. And the whole idea of trial by jury is to get at the truth, isn't it? If O.J. is innocent, he should have walked free. And if he's guilty, he should be punished. But it seemed to me the defense in this case was not trying to get at the truth. It was trying to obfuscate the truth. It didn't want justice. He wanted to get O.J. off. It was a win, at any, win in any way. And then when they did win, there's this exaltation and celebration at the humiliation and defeat of justice. That's what offends American. Do I have at my fingertips a way to reform this system? No, but I'll tell you this. Today, America's criminal justice system, like its welfare system and like its education system, has lost the confidence of the American people. And I think we all ought to take a look at ways and means of reforming it. Do you uh, think President Clinton should get into this? Should he speak to the nation? Uh, I, I know the president spoke to it. He said we got to respect the verdict. I would disagree with him there. I would say we got to accept it because I don't think we have to respect this verdict, which was wrong in my judgment. But no, I don't think so unless this issue is exacerbated further. And I hope it's not, Bob. I hope the country gets this behind it and does move on. And we have had revealed to us the depth of the division in this country, which astonished some of us. And the exaltation, I think, was what astonished people. And we got to find common ground, because I think almost all of us want this to be one country. I mean, you mentioned affirmative action. I don't think the way to heal it is through racial entitlements. I think that will deepen the divisions. And we got to get back to the idea of we judge people on the basis of merit, ability, excellence, the content of their character. And I think if we do that, that's ground on which we can all stand together. And, uh, but I don't think we can stand together on the verdict in this trial. What about uh, the impact of this on Colin Powell? Would, if Colin Powell should decide to run, does this help or hurt his candidacy? I, Bob, you know, the, the, the riot we had in Los Angeles was a war of all against all. It was April of 1992. It had no effect on the general election. I think by the time the primaries come around, the elections come around, this is going to have no effect at all. I hope it would help those who try to tell the truth about this trial and what they believe about it, painful as it might be, but at the same time have ideas for bringing black folks and white folks together. And if Colin Powell speaks to those, it will help him, I think. Do you think you could, what would you as a conservative Republican say to black people after something like this? Do you have ideas on how to bring black and white people together? Well, I spoke yesterday to a, to a group of black political leaders 
uh, and economic leaders, and I got a standing ovation. And I talked to them about a couple of things, Bob. One of them was I think we got to get the, and then get back to economics, we got to get the standard of living of all Americans rising again. Black folks as well as white folks are suffering from this declining standard of living. We got anger in both communities and stress in both communities. Part of the problem can be solved if you get the standard of living rising again. But I do think we got to get away from the, the era of racial entitlements. Affirmative action quotas set aside, that's not healing us. That wasn't the ideal of the civil rights movement. Civil rights movement was if you're the best, you ought to have the job, or you ought to get the scholarship, or you ought to get promoted. And I think that principle is a principle on which we can stand. At the same time, I think we're a biblical nation. I think everybody believes that innocent men ought to go free and that guilty men of, of atrocities ought to be punished. And I think that's what was suddenly offended in so many Americans. Here we are, one hour to a verdict in, in, in a case that lasted a year when there was such a mountain of evidence pointing the other way. I think if it had been a hung verdict, you know, 11 to 1 for conviction, I think people would have said, well, you know, the guy raised doubts. But, but the way it came was a shock. All right. Thank we'll you. leave it there. Thank you very much, Pat Buchanan. In a minute, we're going to take another view, and we'll talk with Professor Lonnie Guineer of the University of Pennsylvania. In a sec. And we're back now with Professor Lonnie Guineer of the University of uh, Pennsylvania Law School. Uh, Professor Guineer, uh, uh, Pat Buchanan just now spoke about being troubled by the exaltation and jubilation that came from some quarters. He's talking about uh, pictures of black Americans who were seen on TV cheering. And he said to him that was one of the most troubling aspects of all of this. Did, did that trouble you? Well, I think we have to try to understand why some blacks, and of course it's not all blacks, but many blacks appeared jubilant at the verdict. I don't think that this was, quote, collective dancing on the graves of two victims. I think that may be how some people took it. But I think this was an affirmation for many blacks that their view of the system, quote, unquote, was vindicated. It was an affirmation that the racism that tainted, in their opinion, the prosecution of this case was perceived by the jury in a way that was a confirmation of their own experience. This is a racially divided country, and unfortunately, for many blacks, they do not have confidence in the criminal justice system to treat blacks fairly. Well, clearly, and I think for, for many white people, this was uh, came as something of a shock that there is such a racial uh, divide in this country and such a difference in how two groups of people uh, uh, view uh, this, uh, th this situation. Clearly, uh, Pat Buchanan, who's often known for shooting from the hip, chose his words carefully this morning when yes, he I talked about so. this, when, uh, because it is such an explosive issue. But let me ask you, how do you account for this, this wide gap that apparently exists? Well, it's interesting. Newsweek just took a poll. 67 percent of whites and 52 percent of blacks think that this jury um, this jury trial and the verdict have inflamed racial tensions without any hope of resolving them. And what we need to do is not just to notice the gap, but to try to figure out a way to bridge the gap. There is a crying need for some leadership. We are witnessing not only a racial gap or a racial chasm, but a racial vacuum, a vacuum in terms of the leadership that is willing to go in and try to speak to Americans of both um, races. And in fact, that's another aspect of this, that we have Americans who are not black and not white. So it's not just bipolar, but who is willing to speak to Americans about race. We need a national conversation on race. Well, do you think uh, that there is going to be a white backlash to this? Well, I hope not. I think a white backlash would be moving in exactly the wrong direction. I think that whites need to understand that the experience of blacks with the criminal um, justice system is unfortunately an experience of not being treated fairly. It's an experience in which a disproportionate number of black men are in prison and not in college, for example. And for whites, the experience of blacks with the criminal justice system is possibly the miner's canary. The miners used to take a canary into the mines to signal when the atmosphere in the mines was getting poisonous and dangerous. And I think that blacks are the miner's canary. And we can either dismiss them 
and say, well, this is all about special treatment for the canary. This is canary rights. Or we can take it as the wake-up call that it is, that the atmosphere in the mines is getting very dangerous for all of us. I asked uh, Chief Williams this question a while ago, and I'll ask you as a lawyer, do you think Johnny Cochran was out of bounds? Do you think he played the race card? Well, I agree with Chief Williams that we shouldn't signal or, or single out one particular lawyer, but I'd like to focus on what it means to play the race card, because I think that's something that we're talking about without really understanding. Playing the race card suggests that Johnny Cochran was playing to the racial prejudices of the jury, but as one of the black jurors mentioned, this was not an all-black jury. There were three people on that jury who were not black. So we have to think about what it means to talk about race. It's not simply playing a card as if race is a wild card or an extraneous card. He was talking on some level about the way in which the experience of blacks with the criminal justice system is an experience that um, corrupts or that um, uh, disallows blacks from believing in the integrity of that system. And we have to deal with that. That is a racial condition, not a racial but, card. But wasn't he, in a sense, uh, telling the jury to, uh, 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 urging uh, uh, jury nullification? In other words, uh, put the facts aside and, and let's send a message. Well, is that a good thing? Well, I think that um, the history of jury nullification in this country is an honorable history. It comes um, from a tradition of nullification having to do with many issues in which jurors are sending a message, not that they are ignoring the facts, but they are sending a, mesion, a message that they are acting as the conscience of the community and that we have to listen to that message, that the conscience of the community, and I think that from what I've heard, many of these jurors were acting very conscientiously. They were acting from their common sense, and their common sense is something that we have to, as a society, take into account. But when you're saying send a message, I mean, that the first person who said that that I recall was George Wallace when he told voters to send a message. You're, you're not saying, are you, that a jury should disregard the facts in a case I am not to saying find that some higher truth? No. I, I think, however, that we have to be careful when we use the term the truth. I think what we saw in this case is that there are many truths, and we have to be in a position to try to hold in our minds all of those truths and to work with all of those truths so that we can understand that the jury was dealing with the facts as they saw it from their experience, and that their experience is a legitimate experience. It is part of the American experience, and we have to, as a society, move beyond the um, racial divide and the racialized way in which blacks are experiencing the criminal justice system. Unfortunately, the criminal justice system has been our primary instrument of urban policy. It is the face that we show the inner city. All right. And it cannot bear that weight. We have to end it there. Thank you so much, Professor. Well, John Roberts you. will have the rest of the news tonight on the evening news. That's it for us here. See you next week on Face the Nation. <laughs>